So hello, everybody. Um, I'm Christoph. Uh, we come in from the warm and sunny coffee break outside to this little bit colder room, but Felix and I will introduce you to the sunny, sunny English landscape garden and bring a little warmth into your hearts, at least if it's a bit colder outside. So I've been playing games for over 30 years now, close to 40 maybe, and they've affected me deeply. And I've got sometimes this uh, strange affliction. Maybe you know it when you see, it's, it's called game transfer phenomenon. It's when you see game elements in real life. So when, when most people tend to see this, I might see this. Uh, has it happened to you too, to you? To whom has it happened to such things? Okay, thank you, I'm, I'm not alone. <laughs> and sometimes even, even this. So when I walk in the forest, I happen upon such strange scenes. And so some years ago, it happened when I worked in a, in a park in Southern Poland, and I was idly wondering, is there a troll living under that bridge? And then I realized the whole park is essentially a gaming space. And uh, that's the point we will be trying to make in this talk, Felix and I, uh, that the English landscape garden is uh, actually a walking simulator in which you have to walk. And the experience of the flaneur in the English landscape garden is comparable to the experience of a person walking inside a computer game, inside a walking simulator. Thank you very much for introducing your pastime activities to us, Christoph, <laughs> and for sharing uh, what you do out there, namely going out in, in parks, for example, and searching for that extra bit of magic in the world, for finding that, that bit of extra excitement wherever you go. Um, because what you're doing there that actually has a long-standing uh, cultural tradition and in Central Europe, as you rightfully called it, uh, we typically connect these traditions to one very specific key term. And there we got it with a picture even, the idea of the flaneur, who I today want to discuss as a projection surface of wanderlust, of the idea of walking out, being physically present in a space, and trying to find a very specific je ne sais quoi out there, a kind of specific ambience, something that raises your spirit, something that leaves you with a positive energy. Um, that's what we connect to that term. Flaneurs are on the one hand historical figures. There were actually people strolling around in parks, believe it or not. But at the same time, flaneurs are much more than that. They are basically a canvas for authors, for filmmakers, or for game designers. <clears throat> Should I stand cl closer to the microphone? Ah, okay. I'm a loudspeaker, but I need a loudspeaker to be a loudspeaker. I got it. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. So um, everybody online, I hope you can hear me now as well. Thumbs up. Awesome. Let's continue with discussing the idea of this, this literal, uh, literary archetype, as I want to call it. The flaneur as a character that you make use of if you want to transport somebody in an environment and have them explore that environment thoroughly and what kind of feelings, emotions, sentiments they can draw out of it. Therefore, flaneur characters uh, share some typical character traits. They're always out there tracing the romantic ideal. So, Christoph, you are indeed a flaneur searching for magic in this world. Uh, this can also go into other dimensions of the romantic uh, flaneurs. We can also connect to the spiritual, for example, trying to find transcendence by becoming one with nature and the beauty of nature. The flaneur is also always somebody seeking contemplation on self and space when going out. So um, what I really admire about your photos, for example, is um, that they are completely within the moment. There's you know, no outside world to be visible. It's just you, the thing you see in the environment, and what you imagine to be doing with it as you are a, a avatar in this video game that is real life. And a flaneur is also a queer agent. Harald, thank you very much for introducing Bonnie Ruberg yesterday. This really saves me a couple of minutes in my talk. Uh, video games have always been queer, but so has the flaneur always been a queer character. In literary studies, we quite often discuss the flaneur as being queer with regards to gender identity. Think about dandyism, think about flamboyant clothing, think about typically male or typically female character traits as uh, encompassed by the flaneur. 
but um, we can also regard Flaneurs as queer in a more broad and general sense, namely as being a misfit in an environment. A Flaneur is always part of, of a surrounding, but um, always as a kind of observer, spectator, watcher, somebody who has to learn how an environment works, how an environment functions. It's never really some person who is belonging to the inventory of a space, so to speak. And therefore the Flaneur is as queer as the avatar in a video game, we could say, uh, where we always uh, are present in a virtual world through the avatar, but at the same time, we are of course sitting in front of the computer screen, not being present in that virtual world at the same time. Um, this also leads us to one more very important hint about the function of the Flaneur. Um, the character of the Flaneur is always in a codependency to the environment. So however the environment is designed, however the environment looks, is having a shaping impact on the role and the agency of the Flaneur, um, which actually leads to some discussions in, in literary studies, but also in promenadology. So the actual study of walking habits and the grand question, where do Flaneurs actually come from? Do you guys have an idea? I mean, the word Flaneur is French, so that might be one important hint. We have some lines of argument going for the Flaneur coming from France or basically from the Parisian scene. There's truth to that. However, there's also another strand arguing for the Flaneur being typically British. Both are correct, actually. Um, we have strong arguments for the Flaneur having its origins both in Paris, but also in Great Britain. And this actually teaches us a lot about how environments can actually shape what we would want to do in them potentially. Christoph. Yeah, because the predecessor of the English landscape garden is the French formal garden or French formal part. And as you can see, it's quite different from the, from the natural environment I showed you before. Uh, the French formal garden is dominated by straight lines, by geometrical elements, by circles, uh, the uh, uh, ornamental flower beds, and even the, the shrubs, the bushes and uh, trees are cut into geometric forms. Uh, people are guided when people walk in, in these parts, they are always guided towards the seat of power, towards the, the mansion, the castle that is always in the, in the focus of all these, of all these pathways. And so the, the uh, French formal park is a demonstration of power. It's a demonstration uh, of the power of the monarch, of the noble, but it's also a demonstration of the power of mankind over environment because it's able to force nature into unnatural forms. It's able to force nature into straight lines, into circles, into, into globes, uh, into unnatural forms, and thus mankind dominates nature. In contrast, the uh, British, the English uh, landscape garden or park in the English style is basically a walkable painting painted like this uh, by Claude Lorrain uh, has been the, uh, the model for these English landscape gardens. And by walking, by exploring the garden, you should happen upon moments, upon viewpoints that present to you a picturesque view that is just like you were inside such a painting. Uh, so the visitor in an English landscape garden is uh, directed from one interesting view to the next. And so, um, yeah. And so you are introduced from one amazing view to the next, uh, just as the view of the landscape garden is. And what the, the actual achievement of this is, is immersion. So once more, we are steering towards a key term that we know from proper game design exercises. And to one more important question, Namely, what is it actually that we're seeking here? Why do we want to immerse ourselves in these environments and play according to different rules? Uh, one phenomenon we've already discussed, the idea of potentially escaping a non-magical reality in order to find mystery and wonder by going to different places and fully being within them, forgetting about the outside world. Other reasons, um, especially with regards to the history of flannerism, can be seen in leaving norms, roles, and social expectations behind. So for example, when we look at Germany in the 17th and 18th century, going on a leisurely stroll in a park was one of the few way for upper-class uh, women to actually escape the confines and restrictions of 
being the housewife, of having to follow rules and orders at home. This is where you could be free with your own thoughts and um, yeah, be, be free to explore your own thoughts as well. It can also be a escape from the dictate of capitalism. That's actually typically Parisian Flannerism. Uh, we have an art scene in the 1950s, 1960s. They refer to themselves as situationists at times, and they actually practiced Flannerism as a way to, to fight capitalism, to make people aware of the clockwork that is commuting to work in the morning, to make them aware of the, the hazards and dangers of uh, traffic filling the streets of Paris. And in a sense, we also do this to escape ourselves at times. Dun, dun, dun. It sounds much more dramatic than it is, but the basic idea really is we want to immerse ourselves in order to um, also fulfill different roles ourselves, in order to play somebody else, in order to be somebody else. We're getting closer to closer to video games with every single step we're taking here. Isn't it amazing? Because so the tradition of the flaneur um, is uh, also held up high in the 21st century, albeit we have a lot of variations here. Uh, one of them being parkour running, for example, which also treats environment as something entirely different. But here it's not really just the magic that we're searching out there. We are turning urban environments, for example, into obstacle courses that we try to solve or puzzles maybe we could say. Then there's the phenomenon of urban exploration, which means that you explore an environment to learn about its past and not in a way that a history book would teach you about past, not in the sense that a teacher would educate you about past, but you want to get a personal and intimate look into uh, what has shaped the environment that you're in. And finally, of course, video games where environments can be very different than concrete real life physical environments and where finding out about these rules of the environment are explicitly exciting. And so it's no great wonder that um, while landscape artists and painters tried to immerse you into their work by doing this, game designers follow quite similar strategies. That's the opening scene of a walking simulator called Everybody's Gone to the Rapture by the British development studio, The Chinese Room, which introduces us to a, a drawn landscape. And as we wait for the introductory scene to be concluded, it slowly but surely fades into the actual virtual landscape that we are then allowed to explore when playing the game. And what's really cool about this one is that typical to walking simulators, the game is not very obvious about its rules and what we should do. So every time I play this game in a classroom with my students, everybody's just waiting when this happens. Nobody dares to touch the mouse. Nobody dares to touch the keyboard. And only after a couple of minutes, people realize, oh, we can actually you know, change our perspective. We can actually move around in here. And then they realize that they're actually traversing a landscape painting or in fact, an actual virtual landscape garden with this one and are eager to explore its rules. Speaking of an actual landscape garden, this is basically the real life example of the image I, I showed you before. This is uh, Luxembourg Palace Park, which is the largest uh, park in the English style in Austria. It's just uh, south of Vienna, a few kilometers south of Vienna. And you have got this, this uh, castle on an island in a rather large lake. And the castle can only reach by ferry by paying the ferry woman 70 cents, you can get to the castle. And there's already an obstacle there that you have to surmount uh, to, to get there. And on the right image, you will see uh, right above the swan, there's this, this grotto. And when you, when you stand on the other side of the, eye, of, the, of the lake, you see this grotto on the, other, on the other side and you see, okay, that's interesting. I want to go there. And you have to figure out the pathways that have to lead you there. Um, and so, on. so we are gently led from one landmark to the next. You always see something in the distance that you want to reach. And Luxembourg is built around this idea of chivalry. It was a Habsburg castle. It was used, used for, for relaxation, for leisure time by the, by the Habsburg family. Uh, and everything is built around chivalry. You've got this castle on an island, you've got a grotto, you have a Gothic bridge, you even have a large tournament field, even though it was hundreds of years after actual tournaments happened. And uh, so this is, this is an experience space you are led through. And I have not found lots of mentions in literature about uh, parts as uh, compared to games, but this is an interesting quote by Ernest 
Adams in Gamma Sutra from 1998, so long before the genre of walking simulators. And he writes about uh, Lancelot Capability Brown. It's, it's a nice nickname, Capability, actually. Uh, he was a very prolific garden designer. He designed more than 200 gardens and parks. Uh, he was one of the most famous garden designers of the, of the 18th century. Uh, and the most important uh, sentence in this quote is one of the principles of his design was surprise. So following a path would lead to an unexpected vista or a statue that was hidden from the main house. So everything wandering around the English landscape garden, you're exploring, you're constantly surprised and you're piecing together in your mind a story that comes from before, from your experiences, from your knowledge of Arthurian legends, from your knowledge of Greek mythology, and all this will create images and stories in your mind. And the next quote is a little bit more specific. Uh, it's not about bounded spaces, and the contrary, exactly as in video games, it's about concealing the boundaries that are there that are not perceived by the rulers. And there we are already in the theme of the conference about freedom and oppression, because you are gently guided, you, are, you have boundaries, but oftentimes you're not, you're not aware of them. Uh, the final sentence, um, not the final sentence, but also most important sentence, the entire landscape is constructed about a certain uh, atmospheric effect, which is intended to evoke the sublime. And this is what what the park has to do, and this is also what video games often tend to do. Thank you, Christoph. The sublime is, of course, a large keyword for us to talk about. Uh, sublime is what the British philosopher Edmund Burke describes as a sort of delightful terror that we can experience. Delightful, uh, for example, when we go out into the nature in the sense of nature is beautiful, nature is vast. But that vastness may also hide dangers because we not really know to what kind of rules does the place that we inhibit play. And one wonderful example in the world of walking simulators that we can use to discuss this is Dear Esther, uh, actually the first modern walking simulator, kind of the, the, the grandfather of walking walk, uh, modern walking simulators, in which the sublime plays an important role in how the entire game is designed and in which the sublime teaches us about game design strategies in walking simulators. Because um, what Dear Esther definitely does is that it features a vast variety of unu unique environmental narrative capabilities. Uh, it does things that we can't do in real life park design. So for example, the time of the day changes depending on where on the island we are. And at the same time, uh, it shows us how awesome it is for a virtual world that it can keep secrets from its players. Uh, this is where we really don't know anything about what's going on. We wake up on an island, we hear a narrator who is reading out a letter. So we don't even know if the narrator is talking to us, talking to somebody else. Who are we? What's going on? We don't know. And we are excited by this. We want to explore this island, but at the same time, we can be scared by this. Uh, one of the big discussions when walking simulators were still a new thing and players experienced walking simulators for the first time, for example, was, can I actually die in this game? We are so used to video games featuring health bars or, um, featuring instances where we can fail as players, die as players. And there are, for example, some creepy uh, beings. We don't really know what they are hiding on the island of Dear Esther. They can't harm us, but we don't know that. So we are always, we are enjoying the, the side of the island, but at the same time, we are always on the lookout, always watching our backs, what's going on here. And this is a phenomenon that Oscar Moralde um, refers to in, in reference to Heidegger as the Geworfenheit of the video game, the thrownness of the video game. We are thrown into a virtual environment and we know nothing about it. We have to learn everything from scratch. We ideally need somebody to take us by the hand, uh, a tutorial setting, tutorial missions, a NPC character, a companion who helps us to navigate the environment, or um, we have to learn it by heart as we do in a walking simulator where nothing is, is given away, where everything is a secret. And this is not only true in a ludic sense, in, in order for us to finish the game, we have to learn something, but this also causes a sort of aesthetic longing. So um, Morale, for example, describes that in Dear Esther, um, we might enter this island with a painter's view, with a painter's eye, we want to get the perfect landscape shot, but we are never able to, to see it because there's always one element that's distracting there's always something else in the background, maybe a grotto, maybe a, a radio tower with a, a lighting signal, with a flashing signal. 
So there's always something that urges us to navigate more throughout these environments. And that might lead us to some yeah, potential boundaries to our explorations. Yeah, so if you're not yet convinced that a landscape garden is basically a video game, now you will be, because as you walk through a landscape garden, suddenly you will come to an invisible wall. And uh, this is invisible wall or sun fence. It's intended to keep uh, elements, to keep people and, and animals from the outside out and not obstruct the view from the inside. So the wall is not visible from the inside. Uh, either you have no wall at all, uh, but it is recommended to have a metal railing because a metal railing uh, is nearly invisible and does not obstruct the view to the outside. The view from the park to the outside should not be obstructed. It should be, give the impression that the park is endless, that the park goes on and on uh, to the outside. And in some parts, you even had NPCs. Uh, to the right, you see a typical ornamental hermit or Zier Eremit in German. So some park owners hired persons to live in the park as a hermit and talk to the visitors and give them advice or wise words or discuss with them. So that's another element that can be used to guide visitors through the world. And you see an advertisement was placed for a person who lived inside the park as a hermit and who was, only allowed, was not allowed to shave or only once a year, and then only partially to give the proper impression of a hermit. So, and now we go on uh, to some design, design elements of the English landscape park, because in the hundreds of years that the parks existed, uh, there developed several design elements that were became like, like uh, codified for the park. And in the 19th century, there's a lot of literature about them. And here you see also the element of surprise, because when you, when you uh, place a lake, when you construct a lake, uh, the whole shoreline uh, is not, should not be visible from any one point along it. So the parts of the shoreline should always be hidden. So you have to, to explore it. You have to walk, really walk around the, the lake. And also, if you've got a mansion or a viewpoint close to the lake, the lake has to be placed or arranged in a way that the most interesting view is presented just from this viewpoint or from this mansion. And then we have decorations. We always have temples or ruins or grottos or whatever inside these landscape parts to evoke the images and the stories of the people that, that go there, that walk inside the park. And finally, there's also literature on the process of transforming the, the, uh, the landscape into a park. This is an example of performing and uh, transforming an ordinary farm, farmland into a landscape garden that takes about a decade at least, sometimes longer. The most landscape gardens take about 30 years to be transformed to, the, to their final form. And so you see the straight, straight roads of the farm are transformed into winding pathways, more interesting, partially, partially hidden. Uh, the trees, the tre uh, trees that are already there, there are augmented by other trees to create small forests inside here, possibly waterways, water uh, areas are constructed too. So. Freedom of the landscaper being the oppression of the flaneur, so to speak. So you talk about nature being controlled, and I am now going to talk a bit about how we are controlled by our nature as flaneurs or as players, because the Gewaffenheit or the thrownness into the video game that we experience uh, is also something that we can see as a provocation to challenge what somebody else has designed for us. Uh, first and foremost, us players want to make our own experiences when playing a game. Think about all these different player type models, think about socializers in video games, explorers, achievers, and so on. Um, so whatever kind of environment we are presented with, we try to live it out or fill it with experience according to our own needs and wishes. Even more so, many video games invite us to challenge uh, the rules of the game. What you can see here in a screenshot, for example, is another scene from Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, because players have found out that you can literally slip through some of the bushes in the game and explore areas that game designers didn't want us to see. So here, for example, we have a railroad station, and at some point, the railroad tracks just stop because 
no player would ever go there. So why do we need railroad tracks there? And all of a sudden we turn a video game into urban exploration. In fact, us players have strong powers in actually being able to alter a game's genre with our actions. We can turn this game into an urban exploration game instead of following the story or um, Harald has spoken about speed running yesterday as well. We can also play a game as a speed running game and all of a sudden it becomes a chance more of a parkour simulator than an actual narrative or spiritually enlightening environmental experience as in a walking simulator. And ultimately, of course, us players are actually able to alter and modify the landscapes of a game. Many video games can be modded. Some are explicitly demanded to be modded, so to speak. Think about Skyrim or the Fallout games with uh, comprehensive modding tools for player communities, but even with other games, it's typically not too difficult for a savvy player to figure out how to alter a virtual environment according to their wishes. So now we can ask the question, did uh, the design of the English landscape garden actually uh, affect video game design? So I don't no an answer to the question, but that was a parallel development uh, that gives us some insight. So uh, also in the 17th, 18th century, the pleasure garden or entertainment park evolved. And as Felix said, the landscape garden was more for the upper classes, but this was popular entertainment. And there you had food stalls, you had uh, like jugglers, actors, live music, firework shows, and so on, just to entertain the people. And later on, in the end of the 19th century, you had mechanical rides like carousels and roller coasters and so on. And this came together with the design of the English landscape garden into the theme park, because the theme park follows a certain theme, but like the English landscape garden, it guides the visitors from one attraction to the next and tries to, to get them into the mood, try to give them an impression and try to, to allow them to tell, to construct a story inside their minds. And there's also uh, lots of uh, literature about uh, comparing the, the theme park to the landscape garden. Uh, so like this, if you, in, uh, if you replace the words theme park with a video game in this quote, it still works. And also here in a book about game design, uh, the, the the whole chapter is, is called Everything I Know About Game Design I Learned from Disney World. So Disney World is, of course, the prime example of a theme park designed basically like a video game and can be compared to a video game. So the theme park is the closest, uh, the closest we have in a real life location to a video game. But there was also there is also a park in the English style that has uh, appeared in several video games. I'm sure you all know it. It's this one, it's Central Park in New York. It's a park in the English style and it's appeared in several GTA games and other games too. So to conclude, we want to offer you this model, Felix. Thank you, thank you. Because I guess by now, even though we use the terms quite a couple of times, you might be wondering, uh, why did we apply for a conference about freedom and oppression in games with a talk about a leisurely stroll in a British landscape garden? Anarchy in the UK, you may be asking? Yes, partly, because uh, thinking about games in terms of freedom in, and oppression is something that might teach us valuable lessons about how to become better game designers in the future. And uh, besides, you know, in inspiring a intoxicating friendship and the mutual joy and love for talking about landscapes. Thank you very much for that, Christoph. We came to the um, Conclusion in the very end that uh, landscaper and flaneur, game designer and player, there's always a back and forth between granting and seeking freedom or granting and seeking oppression. So a landscaper may design a park according to rules. So there's an element of oppression in here, but a landscaper also wants to grant freedoms to the visitors of a park. At the same time, us as players, we do enjoy freedom in video games thoroughly. But at the same time, if a game gives us too much freedom, as many walking simulators do, we might ultimately try to find our own rules in order to somehow make sense of that Geworfenheit of the video game. So there's a back and forth between freedoms and rules. Um, there's also a couple of open questions that we just want to throw out here because we can learn something from it. But we could also ask, what can a machine learn from it? 
Uh, hopefully you have seen these beautiful background artworks um, that we've presented to you with our slides. Christoph made them, or rather Christoph had a machine make them for him because all of them are AI generated. So an open question with which we wanted to end would be, can we actually teach a computer AI the rules of landscape gardening and develop some sort of randomized walking simulator? Simulator? Could we call it that? Yeah, um, that's an open question. Maybe it's one inspiring for you. To all the other questions, we are now available. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>